My name is Steve Tillman. This is Chris. Uh, Chris Fairpan. How are you doing? So we modified the first bit of the presentation just to make it a little bit more interesting. So it's the same content, but we thought we'd make it a little bit more fun at the beginning. Um, so I run strategy, and Chris uh, run customer solutions for Perfectar. So we thought um, I'm a Brit, but I spent quite a long time living in the U.S. And uh, Chris I, lives. In I'm from the Boston area. I, I won't hurt you with my Boston accent, but it may come out occasionally. And in the U.S., Halloween is a really big deal. So we thought we would bring a little bit of Halloween to the U.K. and talk a little bit about some of the worst. Both of us have been in the industry, you know, 20 plus years. We've seen some pretty scary things with data. So we thought we would share some of those with you today. Um, number three on the list. Inside every company, there is the toxic combiner. So what is a toxic combiner? This is actually a real use case given to me by a friend uh, in Canada. I won't name the bank. So a particular employee walked into his annual review for his salary. This particular employee was in the data team and had a list of all the employees in his team. Now, this particular bank, everyone had to take out a corporate credit card. So what he'd done is he'd cross-referenced from his team to the corporate credit card source. This was not a particularly locked down system, but when you fill out a credit card application in the US, you have to fill in your salary. So he then linked to the salary and turned up in this meeting with a full list of all his co-workers plus their salaries and proceeded to negotiate based on how his salary rise was compared to everyone else's. Much bravado from doing that, but this is a good example of a toxic combination. It comes from pharmacology where if you combine two drugs, you kill someone. In the data world, if you give someone too much access, they can do really scary things with it. So our number two persona is called the, the creeper. So this is around how information you're listening to, in this case, on your headphones can create some issues. So there's a lawsuit right now that alleges that Bose headphones, which, you know, traveling a lot, I see a lot of people wearing those on the plane, um, they're recording what you're listening to. And this may not seem initially like a big deal. Maybe it's music, your music choices, but it's also things like podcasts, right? Health recording. Maybe you're interested in particular areas about health or diagnosing your health. Maybe you're listening to particular political podcasts. Maybe you're listening to voicemails. Maybe your text messages are being read to you in your headphones. So this is a, just an example of how that information can kind of creep up and be shared with, you know, without your knowledge. We have a far worse example than this, but we got censored. If you come to the booth later, we'll tell you, but you think this is scary, there's, there's much Yeah, there's the worst one. <laughs> Number one, the share it alls. The people inside your organization that have data and want to share it with everyone. Um, I'm going to do a little poll. Stick your hand up if you know what this is. Okay, so 50% of the room. This is a Napster logo. For anyone under 35, back in 2000, this is how 7 million plus people shared music. Completely illegal. This is a black market for music. Um, I was at university at the time, down in Kent, and people would basically download and share. These were MP3s. And this is completely illegal, like cuts out the artists, you know, no money to the, uh, the various record companies. No longer in existence because they got sued. The, the site has been uh, rebranded. Is that, is that your actual music list too? <laughs> uh, this came from Wikipedia, <laughs> but... Uh, um, so what happens today? Today, you stream it using your favorite service, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, whichever your favorite service is. But why? Why do you use those things? Because it streams the music straight to your device. It abides by all the copyright and other pieces. And effectively, they made it really easy to do the right things. So just like Napster was a black market for music, this quote came from a customer. The customer basically said, look, inside my organization, there's a black market for data. It's not that people want to do the wrong thing. It's just we have a business problem. They're trying to line up data to a use case to solve that problem. And all across the board, you know, we're using it. We're not aware of the regulations. Privacy is a thing that we think about, but don't do anything about. 
let alone the ethics of those use cases. And you saw some pretty sort of scary use cases earlier. So what do people want? People want Spotify for data. There are a lot of catalogs and governance tools out there that will definitely let you find data. They'll let you look across your assets and sort of reach it. It's kind of like Amazon for data. You could go and put stuff in your shopping basket. But the next step is, how do you deliver that data? How do you get access? Most of the governance tools today will have little buttons saying differential privacy, et cetera, but they'll give you the email address of the person that owns that data set. You'll then get into an email battle with them about what you can access. And the second they don't like it, they'll loop in the governance team, the legal team. And this process on, in most companies takes two to three months. Um, you know, I've seen it six months. There are, there are you know, Customers that, you know, when they started with us, it was five to six months internally to get access to a data set. And that was considered the norm. And it's not technology. You've got Snowflake here, you can spin up DBT, you've got your favorite reporting tool. It's not a technology barrier. It's a legal barrier to access to that data. Let's play the video. So this is our data exchange. Just give you an example of how a consumer could come in, search for, Sorry. Search for data. <laughs> it's okay. Can we go back one? Search for data across data sets. So like Spotify, you're looking for your music. I can tag my data. I can understand a brief description about the data. I can search and find the data and say, I want access to that. I can add it to a project, kind of like my shopping basket for data. As I add the data that I'm using for my particular need, I'm thinking about what am I using this for? I'm telling somebody what am I using it for? I'm assigning a purpose. I'm letting them know how am I going to use this data. And that's a very important theme that we have in our exchange that we'll talk about. You're going to hear a lot about data products today and data meshes. This linkage point is critical. The ability to package stuff up as a data product, but then deliver it instantly to that customer. The other thing that's very interesting in this space is that everyone understands the data owner. These are the people that own the data assets internally. They want to help you monetize it. Monetize it can be a scary word, but they want to allow you to take value from that data. Data consumers, these are the people that want to apply data to a business problem. The group that have always been neglected are the guardians, the legal and compliance team, the governance team, et cetera. What we do is we bring all of them together. We think each of them should have a seat at the table. They all talk different languages, so you have to have the common point, and metadata ties them all together with a full audit trail as well. So we learn from our customers. So ABN AMRO was a long-time customer of Protar. The company started in 2014. They have basically built a data exchange on top of our platform. Um, if you're interested, Pearson, who uh, is their chief architect, actually wrote that O'Reilly book, which is very good in terms of how to model things. So we learned from them. So starting about two years ago, we basically re-platformed. We added in a data exchange inside our platform. They basically said when they looked out in the market two years ago, there was no one that did this. No one combined privacy with a marketplace. And now, of course, working with them as a design partner, we've built this. It actually went GA a few months ago. We already have production customers using this at scale. So let's talk about the policy. So this is how we think about a, a policy on this. I think traditionally we have access controls, things like who is Chris, my identity, where am I located, am I in the US, UK, what may have, you know, what may regulations may I need to care about because of that. But I also want to think about legislation, data. So the idea is that I'm not just leveraging access controls, I'm also leveraging what's in the data, what am I using it for, what's the context? And the context is the, a metadata-driven approach to fulfilling that. This is one example of identity location as a common access control profile, a way of controlling data regulating what, how it's used, but we also purpose and think about the data along to say, hey, this is Chris, he's doing a marketing analysis. His data is located in the US. He's okay to use that data. I could say, you know, I could add any one of these to that to say, to make that protection and that filter even richer. So we basically built a data platform. So this is all container-based. So we have 
a data plane, which is where all the deployment happens in the enforcement. Protar is the first and only vendor to do dual deployment here. So we do both um, what's called access specific protection, um, so access control, but also doing data center protection as well. So if you know the sort of space from the analyst perspective, we both do both static and dynamic um, enforcement. The control plane is all metadata. So the control plane is where the policies are defined. We run on all the different cloud providers, so completely container-based architecture, highly scalable, customers using it with 12,000 users on the reporting side. And we do all these different types of enforcement, so ABAC, RBAC, PBAC, uh, row-level access control as well. And the data plane is where all the enforcement happens. So we don't have a single enforcement point. A lot of vendors here today have a single enforcement point. We can do multiple enforcement points. You do the enforcement as close to where the data exists as possible. And then the control plane is all metadata. So full workflow engine in there, plugging into your favorite discovery and classification tools, your favorite data catalogs. So you've got Calibra here, you've got Alation, you've got data.world, et cetera. And then plugging into identity management systems as well. So we do both, both pieces, but control plane, all metadata, data planes, where the sensitive data lives. Sensitive data never leaves your environment and we protect it in that environment. And then the hybrid approach means that we can for example, if you're moving data to the cloud, we can DID and mask all the data on premise, move it safely to the cloud, and then actually use an enforcement plane to remove protection, to do re-ID and then DID again. Okay, so what's an example of how we do this? So if you look at this slide, this is showing some production type data. User A, we know about user A, we know about their access control, we know the purpose of what they're doing is cost analysis. User B, same information, they have a sign of purpose of I'm doing diversity analysis. Now if you look at this data, there's immediately a, a kind of jurisdictional problem where you have US and UK data mixed together and there may be cross-jurisdictional regulations around sharing that PII data across boundaries. So that's, and we know, so this data set has high utility because it's raw production data but it also has a high risk, right? Because I'm, I may be sharing data that I'm not supposed to share. So how do we fix that? So first we need to say, what are, what's the right jurisdictional concerns to mix? So now we, we consolidate, we say, okay, user A, I know they're in the UK, they're gonna look at UK data. User B, I know they're looking at employee data in Boston. And I know this employee data because I have employee number, I have address, date of birth, gender, maybe a comp figure, higher date and location, right? So now privacy is increasing because I've resolved the jurisdictional problems, but I'm still seeing a lot of personal data here. If I'm a, if I'm a marketing, if I'm doing cost analysis or diversity, I don't really need all that data anyway to do my analysis. So now what can I do with this? So now I can change this data and make it keep the privacy, raise my privacy meter to high, keep that utility still high for the particular analysis that I'm doing because I've taken a policy and I know that the diversity analysis, this is what they need. They don't need the address. They're fine with the state. They don't need the date of birth. The year is, is perfectly sufficient, right? On the flip side, for cost analysis, I'm looking at the cost by location, perhaps. I need that address to know how much the office location, what's my employee profile there. Maybe I still need comp figures, but if I'm doing diversity, I just need a range. I just need to know roughly what the comp amount is for that type of analysis. So you don't, we don't need to, so some other vendors out there will say protecting that data, but when I use it, I'm gonna unprotect it for that use. This is, I can pr keep protect it, keep it protected. It still works for my analytics. So this is showing transformation policies. I'm going into a policy. I have a little description. I take a rule. I have a project purpose. And I can assign a bunch of transformation rules to, those, to that set of data by a class. So one of the nice things that Privitar does is this idea of a logical mapping. So I know that I'm just basically creating a first name. I'm tokenizing that value. If somebody, if another data source comes in and there's a first name column, I will automatically get that protection. 
I don't have to remap that data source into that rule. So all the policies are done the logical layer, and it really makes it very scalable. Most customers, in demos, you'll see 10 to 20 columns. Most customers have thousands of columns. This means that the policy very easily, easily migrates across new sources. So if a new data source turns up, the policies will all automatically map across. You just have to assign the classification. And you don't have to do that in UI. We have APIs, right? We've thought about how I would want to automate that, how I might integrate to catalog tools. So this is kind of showing that our approach, we're fitting into your, the existing ecosystem, right? We know that we have customers that want to be able to do this type of, use this type of platform for loading data into data stores, protecting it on load. We know that customers have a need for a BI tool, for example, to dynamically protect that data because they have some users who maybe get raw access and some who should not. So we can dynamically apply that policy on the read. We can also fit into your data pipeline. So we're not going to come in and radically change how your data is moving around your systems. We can fit in those pipelines very easily. And finally, you know, data catalogs are out there. So this is another opportunity to kind of leverage all the work and that kind of knowledge base you have in your catalogs, use it to action data to your consumers. Um, and, and finally, you know, this is all about controlling provisioning. So we, the UI workflow approach gives you a way to con control and reuse that policy across many different data sources, many different types of users, many different ways that they may be needing to use that data as well. So we've been doing this since 2014, and there are lots of vendors out there that are just realizing now that policies are important. But what we've actually realized is it's not the policy, it's knowing the regulation that drives the policy. We actually spent several years trying to build a map of all the regulations and trying to figure out the impact they had on this, this process and how to drive policies with that. So these are just some of the regulations you need to worry about. Even within the UK, there's a massive concentration and there are new regulations occurring all the time. And then if you have a company where you cross borders, sovereign regions, it gets even more interesting. And then when you actually look at the process that people go through, so what you have to do in most organizations is you have to understand this map of compliance rules. You then have to go to your legal team and say, what does this regulation mean to our data usage in this use case? You have to map down to that lower piece. Every time you do that today, it's a one-off process. It can cost between 10 and $100,000 pounds as well to figure out, can we use data for this use case in this location? And you're looking at source data location, transformation location, processing location, consumer location. You then have to map those, those, uh, that, that, the regulation down to what has to be complied with. You then have to do this process where you map it and say, you know, what's going on? And several times in the, in the, out of 10, so four or five out times out of 10, you'll have to get expert legal advice. So you'll have to map that data regulation down. So about sort of six weeks ago now, uh, Provita, we're a startup, but we acquired our first company. Always a fun step as you grow. We acquired a company called Comoon. It's a uh, data in Thai. What Comoon does, it was founded by uh, an ex-lawyer from a major bank, and he realized that there was no mapping between a regulation and what needs to be done in the policy lab. So for 48 sovereign domains, they've built up a map, basically a rules engine, which says, if you want to use data in this location, processed here for this purpose, in this vertical, here are the pieces of the regulation you need to worry about. It'll break that out for you, and then it links back from a policy to that regulation. It also allows you to communicate. So when you go talk to that legal team today, when you talk to those data guardians, they're speaking a different language. They're not speaking the same technical language that the IT team are. So we allow them all to collaborate. So a consumer can come in and see which regulation, so what's legal effectively, and then we're also starting to look at the ethics of this. So today we look at what's legal, we're starting to look at you know, what's ethically right, and that gets even more country specific, et cetera. And then the idea is to fully automate the generation of a policy from the regulation. So it's not enough to just know that you have to write a policy. You have to actually be able to link that back to the regulation and know what you have to do, and then adapt it as those regulations change. So, 
we have a broad set of customers that are using our platform today. So across different verticals. We started, uh, first customer was HSBC, second customer was NHS. Uh, NHS uses us to DID all of the uh, clinical data sets today across, so we're protecting your privacy within the NHS data sets, and we've grown into these other verticals. But from a prototype perspective, we are the first and only platform to give you full self-service access to that data. So we plug into the data catalogs. If you think of the data catalogs as being like Amazon, we're the Amazon Prime delivery. We deliver that data safely right to your door immediately. So you're going to get immediate access if you want. We accelerate access across all these systems. So those data consumers can come in, group data sets into data products, and then deploy them instantly. We allow you to define those policies. So policies are defined at the logical layer and then enforced across different systems. So it doesn't matter whether you're having a reporting tool user coming in through Tableau, you, you've got a data science tool coming in like SageMaker or H2O, or you want to deliver out a data set to your machine learning and analytics team at scale. We do all those different enforcement pieces. We have the regulatory intelligence. So thanks to Core Moon, we can literally tell you which piece of the regulation you need to care about and how that maps to policy. And then throughout all of this, we give you full auditability. So you know exactly who's using that data. Also, the company built out these things called watermarks. Watermarks are literally a way of injecting into the data stream itself a pattern. That pattern is hidden. It's very difficult to extract and it, it survives sort of transmutation. So as that data moves through your systems, the data set itself becomes a tracking mechanism. Think of it like a chip in your favorite animal, cat or dog. When the data set turns up somewhere it shouldn't, we can extract the watermark per column and tell you where it, it last passed through a processor. It used to be we needed about 10,000 rows to hide that pattern. Version two, we can hide in about 500 rows, the size of a standard query. So the data set itself becomes an audit mechanism. So just to go full round trip, right at the beginning, we talked about some pretty scary use cases of people doing scary things with data. There is a way to combat that. The first is you need to have collaboration between those different teams. You need the legal team and compliance team to be in sync with the data team, the consumers and the producers of data. You need to have policy. You need a logical policy that maps across these different systems that can be enforced statically and dynamically. You need that regulatory intelligence. You need to know what regulations are you have to comply with. You need to know how they're going to evolve. And we basically have built all this together on a single platform. Um, we spent a long time building this. Uh, we went GA uh, a few months ago. We already have production customers using this at extreme scale. Large financial institutions using it with tens of thousands of users. So we, you know, we're really doing this in a very interesting way. If you would like to see this, we're over at Stand 555. Please go over. We've got demos there. The team is over there as well. And we can also share some of the things we were not allowed to share in terms of those really creepy use cases. Chris and I have been around 20 years. We've seen some scary things. But we weren't allowed to talk about too many of them. So come into this little stand. Thank you very much for your time. We hope this was kind of short, intense, and fun, and a little bit different. So, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you.